uh, to walk us through making an accurate diagnosis is uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Heather McLean from the University of Ottawa. And, uh, and she will present some interesting mimics and help you walk through a strategy to ensure that when you make a diagnosis of MS, it truly is MS. Heather? Yeah, thank you for the introduction, Mark. Um, yeah, so this, well, the rest of the afternoon's talk is actually going to be on multiple sclerosis itself. For the next hour, what I'm going to be discussing are actually everything but MS. So things that are not MS uh, that we commonly refer to as MS mimics. And I've subtitled the talk, What are the mimics that you don't want to miss? And the answer to that is easy. We don't want to miss any of them. But um, uh, what I'm going to do for the next hour, we're going to discuss how to spot a mimic, uh, what to do if you find a, yourself presented with a mimic, and then discuss a handful of real life examples that illustrate um, the point and for real life practice. So here are my disclosures. And I should also mention that um, unofficially this next hour is being brought to you by a certain cold medication that Mark was able to buy me at the airport. So if I start speaking really fast, you'll know why. And here are the learning objectives. So if we intend to discuss the topic of misdiagnosis as it pertains to any specific medical um, condition, it's important to first review uh, the diagnostic criteria for that condition. And in terms of multiple sclerosis, our diagnostic criteria are the McDonald criteria, which were first uh, created in 2001 and revised in 2005 and again in 2010. And the McDonald criteria are great in that in many instances it allows for us to make a diagnosis of MS even after the first clinical attack which is great because if we can diagnose something early, it means we can uh, start treatment early. And if we start treatment early, we might be able to prevent early relapses. And if we can prevent early relapses, there's some evidence to suggest that it's those relapses in the first few years of your course of MS that actually are pivotal in terms of driving later disability. The downside of the McDonald criteria and being able to diagnose something so quickly is that sometimes this lends us to feel a sense of urgency to make the diagnosis. And if a patient is presenting classically, you know, typical MS symptoms, MS relapses, typical MRI and other workup, there's no problem there. But the problem arises when a patient presents atypically. And we feel this sense of urgency to make a diagnosis such that we are rushed into making a diagnosis when we're not completely comfortable and um, that's also a problem with de-diagnosing patients later if we make a mistake. So how big is the problem of misdiagnosis in multiple sclerosis? Well, it's believed that the misdiagnosis rate in MS is roughly about 5 to 10 percent. And the majority of our misdiagnosis actually occurs in the sense of overdiagnosing meaning we're diagnosing someone as having multiple sclerosis when it's actually a mimicking disorder. And the uh, mimicking disorders um, uh, are often uh, due to a misinterpretation of an MRI. So it's another disorder that produces white spots on an MRI scan that we put too much heat in. And apart from misinterpreting the MRI, another source of misdiagnosis is a failure to either identify or heed a red flag that might present itself to us in the clinic when we're sitting with a patient, usually on history taking, such as this patient who has a rhino's horn stuck in their flank. And it's a staggering fact that easily over 100 disorders can mimic MS clinically and or radiologically. And among them, sometimes are very common conditions like microvascular, cerebrovascular disease, migraines. So these are so-called other neurologic diagnoses, um, along with medically unexplained symptoms, meaning maybe some psychogenic symptoms, or even normal physiologic symptoms that are misinterpreted by the patient and doctor to be abnormal. 
So a misdiagnosis of MS with another disorder is truly the culprit, sentences the patient to long-term inappropriate op appropriate treatment, and may also possibly deny them of an alternative useful or even curative treatment, not to mention the problems of de-diagnosing a patient after the fact. So what are the red flags that I was discussing earlier? And red flags can come into two different types. It could be something that you elicit on history. So a history, say, of a patient that has a prominent family history of multiple sclerosis, or a prominent psychiatric history in the background, or symptoms like hearing loss, or chorea, or that suggest a peripheral nerve involvement, or skin rashes and joint symptoms. These symptoms which are generally a little atypical for multiple sclerosis. Or red flags could present on imaging or workup. So red flags predominantly being things like a normal MRI scan, or a patient with a longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis, or negative oligoclonal banding on their CSF. And in my experience, because we all see as neurologists a lot of multiple sclerosis, in Canada it's one in every 500 people and in the U.S. it's one in every 1,000 people, so we see this pretty commonly as to be almost routine. And so if you find yourself sitting with a patient and suddenly you think to yourself, that's weird, or alternatively you find yourself suddenly very interested in the patient, Heed that as a red flag as well, because often that means that you're dealing with a mimicking disorder. Because for neurologists, we have this strange fascination with weird and wonderful things. So if we are suddenly interested in a patient, maybe it's an MS mimic. So what do we do when you do find a red flag and you're thinking, maybe I might be dealing with an MS clinic, uh, MS mimic? The first thing you do is you, based on the patient's individual presentation, you create a differential diagnosis, and then you try and do a targeted workup for each of those diagnoses on the differential. And try and be specific, and if you haven't done the usual MS workup, things like doing a CSF profile to look for oligoclonal banding and seeing what the cell count is and the protein count, do it now. And if you haven't done an MRI scan of the spine, because the spine should be these short segment abnormalities in multiple sclerosis, not something longitudinally extensive. And often patients with other disorders like microvascular disease um, can be misinterpreted as MS, and, and spinal lesions are distinctly uncommon in those. So if you haven't done an MRI of the spine, do it now. If you haven't added gadolinium to your MRI imaging, that might be helpful. And even evoke potentials might be helpful to you. And depending on the individual circumstances, if it's reasonable, wait before you start treatment. The reason is, is that waiting a few months for the diagnosis to be clarified can be tremendously helpful. But if you feel like it's an urgent situation and the patient needs to start treatment right away, when you're using your diagnosis, use the term working diagnosis. And I'll often do this in clinic myself. I'll say, I'm seeing this patient with a working diagnosis of early relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. And that way, when the patient comes back to me a few months later, it, it triggers my memory to remember that, oh yeah, there was something atypical about this patient and I have to keep a high index of suspicion for something else to arise. And then if something does arise and you realize that, no, it is a mimicking disorder, you can readjust your treatment based on the new diagnosis. And then you can go ahead and publish the case or present it to your friends. Mark and I just started the MS and Mimics um, rounds, which is a monthly rounds at the Ottawa Hospital um, that we're able to discuss and present cases like this, which is really helpful. Conversely, if a patient presents typically, they've got a typical history, a typical MRI, and a typical workup, there's no need to go order expensive, extensive investigations. In fact, investigations um, uh, uh, tested on our shotgun approach tend to re reveal a lot of red herrings and false positives. Um, it's basically, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. In almost 500 patients in the optic neuritis treatment trial, 
um, looking for patients with optic neuritis, only two were misdiagnoses, and both of these were caught easily on MRI scan. And even patients that you order an ANA in, if they have a typical presentation of MS, it's unlikely that they have a connective tissue disease such as lupus. It's, it's more likely that they're one of the 81% of MS patients that actually have a positive ANA titer, um, of a low titer. And even in Lyme endemic New York, if you test all patients with typical relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, 7% of them are going to have false positive um, Lyme serology, but none of them in a study was actually shown to have um, CNS, Lyme disease. And although low B12 is an important diagnosis to uh, diagnose, more likely if you order a B12, it's that you're picking up an incidentally coexisting condition rather than a B12 deficiency causing the MS presentation. So let's go through a few cases. And the first one is actually a case of marks, actually, because I try and I've given this lecture a few years in a row and I try and shake up the cases every now and then. So this one's a 23-year-old student who presented to Mark with a year and a half history of recurrent episodes of acute hearing loss. And she was tested, her hearing loss um, was measured to be in the low frequencies that were affected, not high frequencies. Um, she was actually treated with pulse steroids. I think they thought it was an autoimmune or, or viral condition initially. And then she had a recent acute painless vision loss affecting one eye. And unlike typical optic neuritis, this patient's visual disturbance was actually peripheral. So she had a, a, a preserved central vision. But she was given high dose steroids and she had a gra gradual resolution in her visual field defect over several weeks. And this was her MRI scan. And I don't know if you can see, but in the corpus callosum, there's definitely involvement there. There's little punctate lesions that you can see that are tiny. I don't know, will it show up? I don't think so, I think I'd have to use it. Oh, no, does it show up? It shows up. Oh, there it is. Oh, but I can't see what I'm doing. Okay, no big deal. But you can see little tiny punctate abnormalities in the corpus callosum. You can also see some abnormalities on the flare image in terms of the axial image in the center. And you can see maybe a few lesions in her left posterior limb of the internal capsule and at least one lesion in the right posterior limb of the internal capsule. And on the T1 weighted images, those lesions, they were fairly acute at this time. They were showing a little bit of T1 hypoattenuation. And so I'm going to quiz you guys, and we're going to do it the old-fashioned way, so a show of hands. What is your diagnosis in this case, your working diagnosis? Do you think this is number one, a cardioembolic ischemic event? Number two, CNS lupus? Do you think this might be Sneddon syndrome? Or do you think this is Susak syndrome? Right. Can't stump this crowd. So Susak syndrome. And so Susak syndrome, just as a brief review, sounds like you guys all know it. It's uncommon. It's fairly easily missed, though, because it is a self-limiting disorder, it seems to be. Um, it can happen almost at any range from pediatric cases to elderly pa uh, patients, but usually it does happen between the ages of 20, 40, uh, 20 and 40, and it tends to be like MS, a female preponderance. And it's the triad of branch retinal artery occlusions, hearing loss, and the hearing loss tends to be the low frequencies. So if you ever have a patient that has, seems to have MS and Meniere's disease coexisting, I have one of those and it really is MS and Meniere's, but also think of SUSACs because it's the low frequencies, and encephalopathy. And, and what SUSACs basically is, it's a little tiny, the little tiny pre-capillary arterioles are inflamed and, and it's a vasculitis affecting those things. And so you get infarcts in the, in the gray matter of the brain, which you can't see radiologically so well, but that produces the encephalopathy. You get it involving the white matter of the brain, um, which is what we do see on MRI scan. And it can really mimic multiple sclerosis, but I'll show you a few little MRI pointers on the next slide and it can affect the uh, retina, and it's the fluorescein angiogram that's often key in terms of being your diagnostic procedure. <clears throat> um, 
There we go. So he, is this my, no, where am I going? There's your MRI, that's the SUSACs. Here are MRIs and SUSACs. So you can see in this patient up here, the MRI findings in the corpus callosum, unlike MS, which are usually on the undersurface of the corpus callosum, in SUSACs, it's usually the mid portion of the corpus callosum. And often on the T1 weighted um, sequences, they look like little bites have been taken out of it because they're little holes. They are infarcts. Um, and on flare or T2 weighted imaging, these lesions in the corpus callosum can look like, like what you see in the middle image. Um, in the posterior part of the corpus callosum, they can be called snowballs or they can be um, sort of linear looking lesions they call spokes or they can look like a little icicle hanging down from the top of the corpus callosum. And in the posterior limb of the internal capsule, you can get a sequence of these little tiny acute looking infarcts that will show up and, and they're called a string of pearls, just like in our patient. Um, so the prognosis is that it's self-limited, um, can last six months to five years, and sometimes patients can get away with very little disability residually, and others they can be quite profoundly impaired with lots of cognitive deficits. So if you do see it, you can treatment, treat it, although the treatment is anecdotal. It tends to be acutely with methylprednisolone for relapses, um, followed by generally uh, uh, a chronic corticosteroid use in association with some type of steroid reducing agent like azathioprine. And some patients have responded to monotherapy with steroids or immunoglobulin. So let's move on to case two, which is a 40-year-old African-American woman from Texas. And she is married to an HIV-positive partner. And she presented initially four years ago with a severe right-sided optic neuritis that was treated with three days of steroids, but she remained blind in that eye despite the steroid treatment. Her MRI scan at that point was normal. And recently, she had a severe left-sided optic neuritis again treated with three days high dose steroids and now she's blind in that eye too. She has hand waving vision in both eyes. But in terms of other symptoms, she has also been complaining of having episodically bilaterally red eyes. She was actually seen by neuroophthalmology and they sort of thought this was just a viral conjunctivitis that was coming and going. And she's also had painful swelling in the right submandibular region, right up here under the, under the chin bone or the jaw bone. And it was felt that maybe that was a swollen gland. And she also had painful swelling in the upper odor lids, which you can kind of get a sense in terms of this picture up here. They actually said she's awfully puffy right up here under her eyebrows, and I don't know why. Here is her MRI scan of the brain with gadolinium. It's normal, apart from a little bit of rim enhancement around the left optic nerve, which is barely appreciable. And some of her initial lab work. We first did NMO antibody on her, and we did it with the cell-based immunofluorescent um, technique with transfected cells. And the biochemist who read the result said, this may be, possibly, I'm not sure, might be weakly positive. So we repeated the NMO antibody, this time using an ELISA method, which is, tends to be less sensitive than the cell-based assay, but on the ELISA she was negative twice. Her sedimentation rate was 26, so a little elevated. Her ANA was 1 in 640. Her ENA, however, was negative. She had a few white blood cells in her CSF, but her protein was fine. She had no bands and basically all her infectious uh, and cytology workup was normal in the CSF. So in this case, who thinks this might be CNS lupus? She got an ANA positivity, okay. CNS lymphoma, crawling along the optic nerves, neurosarcoidosis, lots of hands there, or who thinks this is an NMO spectrum disorder, bilateral severe optic neuritis? Okay. And in fact, this is neurosarcoidosis, although we don't have a pathological confirmation. And this is my pet peeve about neurosarcoidosis, because you do need pathology in order to have a definitive diagnosis of neurosarcoid. 
But what we did with her is we did a gallium scan. And the gallium scan, well, you can see a normal gallium scan over there on the right where you barely see, a, you see a blush in the liver that's pretty normal. And normally you see a very tiny bit of abnormality in the nasopharynx, or it's not abnormality, that's a normal blush in the nasopharynx. But in her, you see two things that look like their eyeballs. You see her nose on the gallium scan. And when she turns to the side, you can see her parotid glands in terms of uptake there. And that's the typical panda sign, which is described in neurosarcoidosis, where you have bilateral, lacrimal, and parotid uptake. And um, in terms of her, I think the, the thing that she was describing that was called adenitis was actually a little bit of her parotid sticking out from underneath her, her jawline. And in terms of the red eyes with her, I think they were probably just a sicka syndrome because she had such lacrimal gland involvement. And of course, neurosarcoidosis affects multiple systems, almost every organ in the body. Um, it can be like MS, either monophasic, like a CIS presentation, or it can be a, a relapsing remitting one. And in the States, it's most commonly in African Americans. In Europe, however, it's more commonly in Caucasians. Um, if you can catch it in the lung, patients will complain of shortness of breath or cough, or you might see some hyalur adenopathy or an abnormal CT chest. In the eyes, patients most commonly present with uveitis, but lacrimal gland um, enlargement and an infiltration is common, such as with the gallium scan. And it's actually what we tried to biopsy in this patient, but just found some nonspecific inflammation. Having said that, it was after a steroid treatment. You can get some erythema nodosum and arthritis and other types of um, uh, uh, classic findings like hypothalamic dysfunction. Um, can really uh, trigger you to a diagnosis of neurosarcoid. Case three, this one is a man. He's a 41-year-old man, originally from the Middle East, who immigrated to Canada, but he's previously healthy, no medications, and he was admitted with a three-week history of progressive bilateral vision loss. He had some paresthesias or dysesthesias from his toes right up to his nipple line, so he had a sensory level there. He had seven days of urinary retention, and all of this was preceded by a febrile GI illness. And on exam, he was blind with large scotomas, bilateral optic disc swelling. He had a sensory level at T4, and although he could still walk and his motor function was quite good, he had a bit of sensory gait ataxia. And this was his MRI scan. And if it projects well, you can see a longitudinally extensive abnormality affecting the cervical spine with a little bit of swelling of the cervical spine. It's not really necrotic looking though, it's just a little swollen maybe. But the signal abnormality involves basically all of the thoracic spine as well. And the MRI scan of his brain is completely normal. So in this case, what is your diagnosis? Who thinks this is neuromyelitis optica? Lots of hands. Who thinks this is Adam? Couple of hands. Who thinks it might be anti-MOG antibody positivity? Nobody. Anyone think it's a connective tissue disease? Nobody. Well, if you said neuromyelitis optica, you definitely would be right in the sense that it meets the current diagnostic criteria for NMO. What I'll show you later, though, is that he actually was NMO antibody negative, but he does meet the diagnostic criteria. If you said ADEM, because I'll go on to tell you in a second that this was a monophasic event, you'd also be right, because ADEM can present as a post-infectious illness just like this. And if you said anti-MOG antibody positivity, you're probably also right. It's just that this patient presented seven or eight years ago before we knew about anti-MOG. But in retrospect, I think this guy fits clinically with an anti-MOG antibody syndrome. So the ultimate diagnosis is unknown. This is his follow-up. He had, um, well, for, at the time, he had a white blood cell count in the CSF that was 175 cells. It was 95% lymphs, so it wasn't the wasn't the neutrophilia that you often would get with um, NMO, but definitely you can get a, a, the, the, these numbers are compatible with NMO. His glucose was normal. His protein was only minimally elevated, and it's probably because his lesions were not particularly um, necrotic. He had only a systemic banding pattern and a normal IgG index, um, so no typical oligoclonal banding. He obviously had markedly abnormality, visual evoke potentials, this is not surprising. He had a normal vasculitic workup. 
and his NMO antibody was negative and we didn't have anti-MOG testing at this time. But what was most interesting is when we followed him out, even up to seven years later, he has been clinically and radiologically stable and in fact he normalized within two weeks of getting steroids of this attack. And his MRI of his spinal cord now looks like this. So really very normal MRI, maybe a little bit of atrophy. And so we, at that time, called it ADEM, a monophasic post-infectious event. Um, uh, rarely ADEM can be monofocal, but you, usually it's a polysymptomatic post-infectious thing, often associated with encephalopathy. And some patients can present almost like meningitis with a fever and headache. Um, often, uh, M sometimes ADEM can mimic, mimic NMO in that they can have extensive, extensive spinal cord involvement. And in patients that mimic NMO and have negative NMO antibodies but have this ADEM presentation, it's often because of anti-MOG antibody positivity, where they tend to be younger, they tend to be a little bit more male than female, um, they tend to do extremely well in terms of their prognosis. They often perk up really, really well, unlike NMO that often has residual disability. And it rarely recurs in terms of anti-MOG positivity. Um, and normally ADEM looks like this, uh, you know, in terms of big fluffy uh, uh, white matter lesions that are not quite symmetric but a little bit more symmetric than you'd get in MS, less demarcated than in multiple sclerosis. And in ADEM, uh, you often have some um, white blood cells uh, in the CSF, but usually no banding unless it's transient, and usually only a mild increase in protein, although that's variable. So case four is another man. This is a 54-year-old man. This is also Mark's patient, actually, um, who had a year and a half before presentation with him some intermittent weakness of either arm. And in fact, we don't know whether that had anything to do with anything, except that he did get an MRI scan with that, those symptoms, and the MRI of the brain was normal at that time. But what he presented to Mark with was a two-month history of progressive severe left more than right-sided weakness. So initially it was thought to be perhaps an asymmetric myelopathy, but he also had confusion. And this was his MRI scan. So he has fairly symmetric, fairly large, somewhat poorly demarcated lesions. A couple of them enhance a little bit in a few little locations, which is the bottom sequence of MRIs that you can see. And these are his investigations. So he had a normal CBC. His SED rate was slightly elevated at 22, and the CRP was slightly elevated at 12.6. His vasculitic workup was negative. His Lyme serology was negative. He was HIV negative. His CSF had a few white blood cells in it, and his protein was mildly elevated, but his bands were negative. But he did have a leaky blood-brain barrier with a quite a high albumin index of 19.2. But all his infectious and cytology workup in the CSF was normal. So who thinks this might be CNS lymphoma? few hands. Who thinks this is a case of ADEM? Anyone think this is a CNS vasculitis? Few more people. What about PML in this case? Few more people. And this is a tough one. And ultimately, this guy went on to biopsy, because he was tough. So he needed a biopsy, and this was diagnosed as CNS lymphoma. Um, and on review systems, he did have a 10-pound weight loss and some chills for several months. But what the biopsy showed was an intravascular lymphoma that was a large B-cell type with occlusion of parenchymal and leptomeningeal vessels. And just to review, CNS lymphoma can either be primary in that there's no systemic lymphoma uh, um, uh, uh, known, and it tends to happen in immunosuppressed patients, but there's an increasing incidence of it in the immunocompetent uh, elderly ages over the age of 65. Um, and it tends to occur either as a brain mass, single or multiple, or it could be intraocular, or affect the leptomeninges, sometimes creeping along the cranial nerves, or creeping along the spinal cord. And then there's the secondary type of CNS lymphoma, in which patients have concomitant systemic disease, and often when it's secondary lymphoma, it's a leptomeningeal process, 
but in this case it's an intravascular process and in those patients like ours eventually they develop things like skin involvement and multiple organ involvement and it's those patients that can mimic the really white matter lesions seen in multiple sclerosis and the unfortunate um, aspect is that it's often rapidly progressive and usually fatal as it was in, in Mark's case. Case five is a 64-year-old woman of mine who presented with left hemibody numbness and weakness, but no neglect, so it seemed to be a subcortical uh, uh, presentation. The past medical history is migraines with aura, and she did have a family history of stroke, dementia, and multiple sclerosis in her family. And this is a short snapper, because I'm just giving you the MRI, so it should be a spot diagnosis based on this MRI scan with this diffuse white matter involvement that stretches from the periventricular regions basically all the way to the U fibers. So based on that MRI and the history, mitochondrial disorder, anybody? Primary CNS vasculitis? Catacyl? Yep, and leukodystrophy, this is a catacyl case, although it really did look like a leukodystrophy. The, there is a little hint on the MRI, which I'll show you in just a second. And of course, CATASIL stands for cerebral autosomal dominant arteriopathy with subcortical infarcts and leukencephalopathy. And um, these patients have recurrent lacunar strokes before the age of 60. And so what you're seeing on the MRI are ischemic, well, basically infarcts, along with ischemic demyelination. Um, and patients often will have, and at least 22 percent, uh, migraines with and without aura, and the auras can be atypical, like being prolonged or hemiplegic or like a basilar migraine. And in 80 percent of patients, they'll actually have a vascular dementia at the time of death, and in 20 percent, patients will have depression. And it's due to um, a mutation in the notch 3 uh, gene in chromosome 19, and so you can test it genetically, which is what our patient had done. Sometimes you could get a skin biopsy as well, which typically show a congophilic PAS positive deposit um, pattern in vessel walls. And on electron microscopy, um, they have electron dense granules in the media of the arterioles. And MRI is classic in that they have small infarcts that start out in the white matter in the basal ganglia, and early on, patients often just look like regular old um, small vessel uh, microvascular disease. But later on, these lacoons and ischemic demyelination become more confluent, and the key on MRI scan to look for is involvement of the temporal poles and the external capsules such as in the MRI down, down below. So if you see temporal pole involvement and external capsule involvement, think catacyl. Case six is a 33-year-old woman, again African-American, but this patient actually does come from Cameroon originally. Um, and she had a severe right-sided optic neuritis a year and a half ago. She was treated with high-dose steroids and recovered over six months to a visual acuity in that eye of 20 over 30. Her visual evoked potentials were initially absent on the right, but she have some asymptomatic involvement in the left eye as well. And just prior to coming to me, she had a severe uh, optic neuritis, this time in her left eye. Uh, again, treated with high-dose steroids, and she had a quick recovery this time to 2030 again over weeks. And in Canada, sometimes we can't get MRIs until eight weeks later, which is what happened in this case. But she had basically a normal MRI scan and C-spine with no convincing left meningeal enhancement, but she did have a little bit of subtle enhancement of the left optic nerve, just like our neurosarcoidosis patient. So in this dot patient, do you think this is number one, an NMO spectrum disorder? Couple of hands, neurosarcoidosis again, same, basically same presentation, a couple of, couple of hands, CNS lupus, again the demographic kind of fits, Lieber's hereditary optic neuropathy, few hands as well, good, this one's a more challenging, and this one, it came with the workup, it was a, a definitely an NMO spectrum disorder, so she never actually had transverse myelitis, but when we tested her with the cell-based immunofluorescent assay for NMO antibodies, she was strongly positive. Her sed rate was normal, unlike our sarcoidosis patient, and she was ANA negative, and 
um, serum ACE was normal for whatever it's worth. An NMO, of course, is preferential involvement of the optic nerves and spinal cord. Um, usually the vision loss is even more marked than what we saw in her, and, and often if they have a myelopathy, it's severe. Often there's incomplete recovery. She did have incomplete recovery as well. Tends to have a poorer prognosis than MS. And usually the pathology is very necrotizing. So necrotizing cord swelling, um, very severe optic neuritis. Um, and of course, when you have the cord involvement, it involves three or more segments classically. And we do have diagnostic criteria for NMO. Um, and including NMO spectrum disorders, which are basically abbreviated forms of NMO themselves, usually bilateral or recurrent optic neuritis or recurrent transverse myelitis. The MRI scan um, of the brain in, in NMO is often normal, um, but they could have periventricular uh, lesions around the third and fourth ventricle because that's where the aquaporin-4 usually sits pathologically. Usually bands are negative in patients, but they can be positive in a minority, often only 10 to 20 percent. And because NMO is so necrotic, especially if it's, in, so if it's involving, especially if it's involving the spinal cord, you often get a very high protein and lots and lots of cells in the CSF, and sometimes those cells are polymorphs. And of course, the classic finding is NMO IgG positivity, which are sensitivity depending on the assay that you use, but it sits right around the 70% mark in many cases. And of course, the treatment is empirical, but most patients end up being on long-term either azathioprine or um, rituximab therapy or sometimes some others. And our last case is a 26-year-old woman who had a six, this is Mark's patient as well, actually. I've, used, I've, I've borrowed a lot of patients. Uh, yeah, six-month history of progressive weakness and spasticity of both legs. She has mild bowel and bladder complaints. And on exam, clearly pseudobulbar. She had moderate weakness of both legs with a spastic paraparetic gait, hyperreflexia, and upgoing plantar responses. So a, definitely a pyramidal distribution of findings. And this is her MRI scan. All right, we see, here's our laser pointer somewhere. No, it's dead. Can you guys see on the top set of sequences in the posterior fossa, there's little tiny punctate lesions in the middle cerebellar peduncles, maybe a little bit in the pons as well. Try the mouse. All right, just uh, if I can get it over. I'm looking at an angle, but right around here, there's a little bit of little tiny peppering, a little bit of peppering here in the subcortical white matter, if I can see what I'm doing, just a little bit of peppering on the flare sequences here. And in the spinal cord, the flare showed some, oh, actually this is GAD enhance, GAD, gadolinium enhancing uh, scan, so a little bit of peppering there as well. Um, and all that peppering shows up on the GAD sequences of the brain and even on the axial scan of the spinal cord as well. So here's her investigations. She had CSF showing 12 white cells. Most of them were lymphs, though, 96%. CSF protein was slightly high at 0.83. Her CSF glucose was normal. Her albumin index was high. So leaky blood brain barrier, it was at 13, but a normal IgG index and negative oligoclonal banding. And her cytology just showed benign, reactive, mixed lymphocytes. She had a normal serum calcium and normal serum ACE for, again, for whatever it's worth. Her TB skin test was negative. She had a CAT scan of her chest, her abdomen, her pelvis. They were all normal. She even had a bone marrow biopsy that was negative and her gallium scan was normal. So what is your diagnosis in this case? Is this Bickerstaff's brainstem encephalitis? Neurobechette's loves the brainstem. Lymphomatoid granulomatosis or clippers? Good, I cannot fool you guys today. So clippers, it is in fact, is a very rare recently described disorder 
stands for, it's a very catchy name, stands for chronic lymphocytic inflammation with pontine perivascular enhancement responsive to steroids, and the title says it all. It was described by uh, Sean Pittock and, and his colleagues, and to date there's at least 50, if not more, reported cases in the literature. And the classic MRI findings are punctate and curvilinear, curvilinear uh, peppered um, flare and enhancement patterns within the brainstem, usually the pons, um, but also in the peripontine structures, sometimes extending down into the spinal cord and sometimes extending up supratentorially. And often these patients do present subacutely, usually over weeks with a brainstem syndrome. And so bechets and lymph lymphomatoid granulomatosis come onto the differential. Often the patients are ataxic and have double vision. A little bit less frequent, but as in, in the case with this patient, um, had more subacute to chronic myelopathic abnormalities, and you can see on the flare-weighted images, they're pretty subtle. So if they were really that subtle, they could actually technically be missed. So there's where gadolinium really is important. So if you have a patient that's presenting, say, kind of like primary progressive MS over, over um, months, get that MRI scan with GAD just to see. And what the pathology seems to be is a, a T-cell perivascular pathology. And these patients tend to be quite exquisitely um, sensitive to steroids if you get them early. Um, they do need long-term steroid treatment. In, in this patient, she didn't respond so well, but she had had the disease for quite a while before she got her steroid treatment. And often other immunosuppression is required, and we think this is a lifelong process. So seven mimics not to miss, including Susex, sarcoidosis, ADEM slash anti-MOG, CNS lymphoma, Catacil, NMO or NMO spectrum disorders, and clippers. And of course, the key points of the present of the lecture are that many disorders do mimic MS both clinically and radiologically, and the mimics have different treatments and different prognoses. Don't test for mimics at random. Don't use a shotgun approach, but watch for red flags and test for patients depending on the individual case um, based on your differential diagnosis. And using the term working diagnosis when you're unsure or unclear can be helpful. And if you can, in terms of treatment, when in doubt, don't. And there's some references for you. I have a couple of minutes to, if anyone wants to ask any questions. Please, please use the microphones in the center. Hi. So what's your name? Uh, my name is Nazar Sharaf from the UK. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for this interesting talk. Uh, my question is about the neurosarcoid case. The sarcoid, yeah. Can you come closer to the microphone? Um, the neurosarcoid case. Yep. Would you consider Sjogren's as a differential diagnosis, especially with the lacrimal glands, the parotids involvement, and the nonspecific uh, biopsy of the lacrimal glands. Sorry, can you say that again? What was on the differential? Sjogren's disease. Sjogren's, yeah. So, so Sjogren's was, um, uh, the um, Sjogren's is often, can, can often, sometimes it does produce that same gallium scan um, and can really, really mimic MS. Now in her case, she didn't really fit classically in terms of, she had the, she didn't have dry mouth she had definitely dry eyes because I think that's what was causing the conjunctivitis. Her serology was actually negative and she had nothing else in terms of um, like arthritics kind of overlap abnormalities. But Sjogren's definitely was on the differential and we've had a number of patients that have kind of presented in this neurosarcoid kind of way where Sjogren's has to be on the differential as well and that can be a tough decision. And, and in many patients where you don't get a really good um, biopsy too. They end up being in that never, never, never land, you know, presumed neurosarcoidosis versus Sjogren's. So that's really good. Any other questions? Nothing from the back? No? Okay. <laughs> I'll hand it back over to Mark. <laughs>